My name is Ripa Ivy Carlton. I'm originally from Panukto, Nunavut. Uh, I was born on the land when my parents were still living off the land. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to be lighting the traditional oil lamp, which we call the Kudluk in Inuktitut. Um, so back to uh, the time that Inuit were living on the land. Um, the only source of light at the time, because we had no electricity, was the light from the Kudluk. And the, the, they also used the Kudluk to keep the Kamma, which is the sod house, winter, winter home. Um, to light the kamma, particularly in the winter months. Um, they also use the kulluk to cook their food, melt ice, make tea, make bannock. So the one I'm using is a miniature size. This isn't the real size that my mom used inside the kamma. The oil came from any animal fat, uh, for example, seal blubber and they would have to render the fat so it turns into oil, like the one I have inside. You can really keep the flames from smoking by doing what I'm doing. So you can make them bigger or smaller. I sometimes imagine how it was for men because men uh, were the hunters, the providers, the protectors how it would have been for them to come into the Kammak um, on a winter night or day and just see the light from the Kulla, how comforting that must have been. Uh, and also as a child, um, I remember waking up in the middle of the night like the whole, this whole front would be lit during the day, but at night, my mom always kept a little light at the corner. And so it would comfort me, especially waking up from a scary dream, the little light of the kulit would comfort me. My people survived many, many years without intervention from um, medical professions. People knew what to do. People were um, gifted, like today, people knew how to treat people when they were sick, when a woman was having um, their babies, people knew what to do without training, like professional training. So life was very much more simpler back then. Um, and peaceful, actually, very peaceful. I've, I've been told stories of my great-grandmother who was a very skilled midwife. She knew what to do when it came to difficulty with pregnancy, giving birth, all of the, all of the things that uh, are needed. So by the time I was born, we've had contact uh, long before because of the whalers and traders and so, but we were still living in the um, outpost camps with just the Inuit living with, with themselves in a small camp, maybe up to 10 people per camp or less. Um, people dra travel by dog team. We had no such thing as machines or skidoos or, you know. So people just lived this way for many, many years. and. As a girl, I would have been groomed to become um, a mother, a wife, and learned of skills that my ancestors always had. For example, sewing, you know, animal clothing, cleaning, and you know, uh, all of the things they needed to do, how to raise my children. Uh, we have a system, we had a system that worked very well, um, raising children. We have a name, uh, uh, meaning making 
um, capable human beings. That's how chil children were um, re reared by by the people. I mean, you talk about life. Life w went on like that until uh, things started to change for for my people. And the most recent ones, uh, many people have heard of the residential schools. Everybody has heard about uh, those experiences and how it must have been for my mother, my grandparents, all of the people that had children. I know in my own family, my the uh, eldest of my siblings was picked up from this little peaceful camp to go to residential school and many other children were picked up uh, by a stranger and taken away from, from their mom and dad, from all the people that were important to them because, you know, in a small setting like that, you know everybody and um, the love was there, the security was there, just the harmony with one another was there. For some Inuit uh, not to trust the medical uh, for professions, might, there might be many factors. One of the things I thought about was uh, because we've gone through all the trauma, the losses, the grief, you know, when that is not treated within yourself, you start to develop uh, what we call today PTSD. Trauma is awful. It does awful things to people. One of the things that happen is uh, the paranoia, the fear that people begin to live with. And that could be a factor. I know it is a factor in many cases. The experiences of what people went through when they were going to residential school because of the sexual abuse, because of the physical abuse, the verbal abuse can make people not trust. So that's a, that's a big factor, I believe. And then not everybody has had good uh, medical experiences. So whatever hardships that people have lived through will impact how, how they can trust or not trust, you know. If the experiences were good, then the, then the trust would be better. There is a big difference between the medical system in the north and the medical system in the south. In the north, in the small communities, all you have is a health center. There's no doctors, there's just nurses that are in the communities. If you go to Iqaluit, it's different because there's a hospital there. So it's very different in a sense that um, Inuit are coming from very small places where uh, they don't have the choices like we have down here. We have many choices down here. For example, many dentists, you know, many, many counselors, many everything. People may say there's lack of resources down here. I don't believe that. There's many resources here. Maybe to some degree, some don't have the, the resources that they need. But when you go to an Inuit community, you have what what is there and it's not enough to, um, you know, t with the traumas that we've had, the, the problems that we have, people need more services. Epidemics happen to Inuit uh, because of contact, like many, many Inuit died because at the time people were living still in their outpost camps. Um, many, many Inuit died to a point where my mentor had told me that this particular camp, they had close to 2,000 Inuit living there, a big, thriving camp. And because of these epidemics, many, many people died um, because they needed treatment. 
So my mother was one of the people that was sent away by, by a ship to get treatment because she developed uh, TB. And it was before I was born. My oldest, our oldest sibling had been born. Um, so, you know, you can look at it in different ways, but I'm grateful that she got that intervention. Otherwise, she would have died. You know, I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. So I look, I tend to look at it more from that angle. I'm just going to share a story, and a, not a good story, a negative story, actually, which happened to my father the year before I, the, the same year I moved uh, away. We were planning to leave in a month time. My father had a really, uh, uh, he had an aneurysm and he was planning to go on the land with my mother because it was a weekend after the week's work. He had an aneurysm because there's no doctors in the, in the health center. They thought it was an inner ear infection. So they sent him home that night. The next day, he wasn't better at all. So I brought him back to the health center. They kept him there for the day. Finally, a small twin otter plane could, could come and pick him up. My mom and I were allowed to go with him to Iqaluit. Before we got to Iqaluit, he stopped breathing on his own. Luckily, there was a doctor on, on the flight with us. So that was late Saturday. By the time we got to Ottawa, half of his brain was dead because he had internal bleeding. And he died a week after um, a procedure. He, uh, the doctor told us even if he lived, he would be a vegetable. So there's many stories like that. When you are in a small community, it's, it's harder because there's no doctors to diagnose. Um, typical process for an Inu coming down for medical treatment would be um, they would need to be referred by the nurse to go to Iqalui to see a doctor or a visiting doctor would, uh, I guess, put a requisition that this client patient needs to be treated in the South. So coming from a small community, it's getting on a plane, maybe overnighting in Iqaluit because things don't always happen as planned, the weather is a factor. And coming from a further north um, community, it, it gets harder as you're further north because of the distance and some, some small communities can only get how many? Some maybe once a week uh, flights or twice a week. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult process to go through if you're not, you know, feeling well and you're sick or you're worried about your health. Uh, so a lot of the time for Inuit that don't speak uh, English, they'll bring an escort that will be their uh, support person as, as they're traveling. It's even hard to get on, you know, to go through security in Nikhalui because it's these small communities have small um, airports where your, your family comes see you, you, you stay with them till you get on the plane. So it's very different. Um, then to come to the South to go through the big airport and you know, maybe somebody can't walk that well, so they would need to be, you know, taken on wheelchairs, stuff like that. There's many factors and you need somebody to help you navigate even through the airport 
uh, to get to where you need to go. It's a scary process. You wait for your luggage uh, in a very big, you know, airport. So you need somebody to support you throughout the whole thing. And you then you have to go through, you know, transportation to get to where you need to go. It must be uh, very scary because it's, it's a big city and you don't know where you need to go from A to B. So you are dependent on another person to help you. So you need to go to your appointments and how do you do that? You need people to help you go through that because you can't do it on your own in a big hospital. So you need people to help you get, get to where you need to go. And for many Inuit, they have to get treatment whether it's for cancer or any other uh, illness that they have. The cultural differences for the medical uh, team to know about Inuit is uh, to understand that they're coming from a, a, a lot smaller setting where they are uh, coming from communities that they know everybody. You know, you, you greet everybody, you smile at everybody. Um, they're coming from a, a place where it's very familiar for them, and they coming to the South where it's so different. Uh, it would be good to have that in the back of your mind when you're seeing an Inuk patient who, who is not feeling the best at their best and also to be aware that you know they may not say a lot because we're much more comfortable with silence and uh, we can also communicate just by uh, lifting our eyebrow like this to say yes and then no is this so be aware of the facial expressions that uh, people are um, giving um, so it's important to maybe talk slower because it's their second language or they're going through an interpreter they may not be able to speak uh, English so they're going through an interpreter so just to be aware of these things um, when you're dealing with an Inuk the thing to remember also is um, for Inuit, I'm going to say a little bit about myself because I've been in the South many years now, but I need my country food. I, I'll be fine for however long. There comes a time when I just need to have my country food, <laughs> whether it's caribou or fish or seal meat. Um, berries from the north, pilot biscuit that we grew up with. Um, so that's where they're coming from. So it's very important for agencies that are in the south helping Inuit living in the south or um, housing uh, Inuit, let's say, Larga Baffin. To, to have some country food available sometimes because we call it the soul food. We get so much more better after having our country food. That's just, that's just us. I think it's very important for medical professionals to, um, to treat Inuit patients in such a way that they can begin to build trust with them. For example, a smile goes a long way. Also, if you were to take a um, um, few sessions or lessons on how to say Hanuipi, um, means thank you, like even just these little things I think matter a lot. Um, it would also be good to look at maybe uh, adding a picture to your wall that is culturally uh, appropriate, let's say a picture of a polar bear or an Inukshuk 
or whatever you can get that pertains to Inuit culture um, and to um, treat Inuit patients as you would want to be treated if you were in that situation. So little things like that, I think that anybody can, you know, can begin to change a little bit in treating Inuit. That come from a very far place. For my, my mother's generation, I, use, I love the fact that they lived well with the Kalunaks that came whether they were nurses or doctors, because they lived well together. They learned from each other of the differences that they had. And uh, the relationships are important, um, where a lot of us are about relationships. So building a good relationship um, is very important, because my, my mom's generation for those that are still living, kept those relations, relationships with the nurses in particular, and they still can communicate today after so many years. That tells me a lot, that we can all do this. In closing, I'd like to share a little bit about the Inuit Kauyimaya Tukhangit, which governed the Inuit how to live. Um, every day. They were not written, but they're written today. I'm thankful about that. These are the four maligate. Working for the common good of everyone. Maintaining harmony and balance, which we need to remember, which we need to have. Respecting all living things. Continually planning and preparing for the future. So these are the four big maligate, the big laws that my people uh, were governed. Um, and these are very good principles to remember for everyone.